I'm so glad we get to praise him. And uh, it, is, it is such a blessing to think about some of those words in that song where it talks about he is coming again. We praise Jesus because he's coming back. We're not going to be here forever. We're not going to have to deal with politics forever. We're not going to have to deal with that person that you can't stand forever. One day we'll be in heaven. Everything will be perfect. All wrongs will be made right. And we get to praise God because that day is coming soon. Amen? Uh, I don't know what day it's going to be, but it's soon. There's a lot of things that are pointing that direction. So let's open with a word of prayer, and uh, we'll begin the service today. Brother Bob, would you have prayer for us this morning? Amen. You may be seated. Choir, you may head down. All right. Very good. Very good. All right. Make your way down. We praise the Lord. God's been really blessing the church. And here in the next couple of weeks, we are putting a couple more pews in. And going to start filling up. One thing we'd ask you to do, if you would, um, these pews that we put in, we want to save for visitors when they come in, or maybe someone's running late. How many of you like to walk down the aisle having everybody look at you when you're late? I do not like it, and I've been in that position. I'm going to encourage you. Yeah, Bill's just walking in. Everybody look at him. We'll see how he thinks. Yes. Um, we are going to put in some more pews, and uh, we're working on that. We praise the Lord. Isn't God good? God's been blessing, and it's very exciting to see God work. And uh, praise the Lord for this church and what it's doing in this community. I do want to have uh, Miss Dean, would you introduce your guests? I'll embarrass you, not them. Yes, and we've, uh, we've had the pleasure to meet before, and we're glad you folks are here today. Thank you for being with us. I think, I don't know if we have any other brand new or uh, first time in a while guests. I think everyone else, you're just old hat. You've been here before. You don't get any special introduction. All right, what we're going to do, we've had some issues with our, our equipment here today, but I think most of you know the rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. So what we'll do is, if we can all stand... Once we sing this, we'll shake hands and greet one another and say howdy. We'll sing this chorus, and then young people can be dismissed to junior church, and the rest of us will greet one another and uh, say howdy. Gentlemen, if you want to play that for us, you know the song by now. you got to smile as you sing it. You have to be happy. Here we go.
may be seated. All right. I did want to um, just acknowledge, um, where's Wesley? Wesley's right here. Wesley, how long have you guys, your family's been coming to this church? About how long? Where's Frank? About how long? Four or five years. We met him out. We're out door knocking one day, went by their home and they were looking for a church and uh, they came and they've been coming ever since. And uh, Wesley's been in our youth group for several years. On Tuesday, Wesley is going to be going to Job Corps and uh, out there in Ohio and uh, kind of going off to be his own man here and uh, I think looking into a, a different trade and uh, finishing up for his schooling. And um, we're really excited for Wesley and proud of him, looking forward to what God has in store. I know he has different plans and different goals, and we just want God to bless this young man. And uh, we want, I want to just take a moment and as a church just pray for him and uh, pray that God would really uh, show his will in his life. So, uh, Charlie, Charlie runs our youth group and oversees everything that goes on with the teenagers. He's kind of a teenager himself, so it kind of all works together. Um, no, uh, yeah. Uh, Charlie, would you take a moment and pray uh, for... Uh, Wesley's life here and pray that God would lead him and guide him and keep him safe. But would you take a moment and pray? Let's all pray together as Brother Charlie prays out loud. Amen. We're proud of you, Wesley. Even though his parents are ready to get him out of there. No, I'm just kidding. Brother Frank said he's going to give him the boot. But uh, no, we're proud of you. And he'll be in and out throughout the time. And you make sure you encourage him and be there for him. It's a big step, uh, stepping into what God has in store. And uh, what a blessing. We're, we're proud of you. Several things that we are uh, doing as a church. Number one, we are collecting food for a food pantry. Um, and we're not advertising this food pantry by any means. It's not like we're trying to have the biggest one in Muncie. We just want to put some things away. So if somebody has an immediate need, we can help them out. We want to help those who may be going through a hard time. Because all of us have been there, haven't we? Tough time, finances, food, whatever it may be. And uh, so you saw some totes in the back of each store you may have came in, and we're just putting different things. There's a list on the back if, you would, uh, if you'd like to know kind of a few things that keep well. Don't bring, like, milk and eggs. Uh, those don't last very long. Um, but certain things that we'll store, we want to be a blessing to our community. And so for the next, uh, this week and next week, we'll do this, and uh, we'll try to fill up our food pantry so we can be a blessing. Um, tonight, after the evening, service. We'll be having a business meeting. We'll be discussing the church budget and uh, discussing officers in the church and different things for our church. So uh, those uh, that need to be there, please be there tonight after the service. We are having a couple's dinner at Catello's in Pendleton, Indiana, this coming Thursday at 630. If you would like to come to that, uh, today is the last day to sign up. We need to let them know how many are coming. So if you would like to go, there's a sign-up sheet on the back. If you need uh, child care, that will be here at the church. You need to let me know that today if you need that, and we'll, uh, we'll try and work all those things out. So those of you who'd like to go, it is more of a, I want you to... Husbands, really spend some money on your date that night. It is a little more, ex who said amen? Someone over there said amen. Yes, one of the ladies. Spend some money and it is. it, it will be a good time. And uh, I hope you'll be able to go. Several of you couples will have some games. We'll have some fun. And uh, everyone know where Pendleton is? Nobody? Just Google it. Google it. You'll find it. And uh, it's not too hard to get to. Just type in Catello's and we'll look forward to seeing so many there. Ushers come forward. We'll have our mission dinner on the 2nd. We'll go to our local Muncie mission. Uh, we'll have a missionary live stream, Lord willing, on March 5th. And that will start our month of missions. We'll have a guest speaker. Um, 
he is, um, you will not, he's coming on a Wednesday. This missionary, um, he was one of my Bible college teachers and one of the smartest men I personally know. And he is a very wise, godly man. I think he had, um, I don't know if this is wise or not, but I think he had 13 children. I think 13. Um, he still has five on the road with him. They're back uh, from out of the country, and he's going to be preaching Wednesday, March 8th. If I can encourage you to come to that, we're not going to live stream the first part of the service due to safety concerns of where he's at and where he'll be um, in, in his ministry. So if you, you don't log in that night to the first part of it, try to be here if you can. And we'll have a question and answer time. He's been in two different mission fields. This man is a godly man. He's written books, and I know you'll be helped by him. Also, the missions conference coming up, the 18th and 19th. That 18th, we'll have a big international dinner that Saturday night. There's a sign-up sheet. I want you to find something to bring uh, that... It's not necessarily American as far as food goes. And uh, you sign up and we'll have a good time that evening. Let's take up our offering and uh, let's have a word of prayer. Brother Dallas, would you pray? And we'll take up the offering today. Amen. I love that old song. He touched me and made me whole. Let's turn to page number 112 in our hymn books. Page 112. Let's stand once again if you're able to. And we're going to sing about the old rugged cross. 112. Let's sing the first, second, and last verse. Yeah. 
singing this morning. All right, if you'd remain standing, if you're able, if your health does not permit it, we understand. I would like you to grab a Bible, and if you don't have one, grab one from the pew in front of you. It is so important to me that whatever I say from the pulpit is lining up with God's Word, and that's one reason why I ask you to look on. Uh, don't just take my word for it. Let's see what God had to say. The book of Psalms, chapter 80. Psalms, chapter 80. P-S-A-L-M-S, Psalms. I used to pronounce it in a much different way when I was a little child growing up in a, a pastor's home. Um, we would say Psalms, Psalms, and uh, they would always make fun of us. But um, Psalms, if you open your Bible about halfway in the middle of your Bible, it's the longest book of the Bible. It is, has the longest chapter of the Bible, and uh, what a wonderful book this is. Psalms chapter 80, and let's just look at, we're going to kind of overview the whole chapter, um, but I want to look at verse 8 through 14. Would you read that for me, Brother Bob? Why don't you come get into place? Psalms 80, verse 8 through 14. Powerful chapter. And a powerful chapter about repentance and revival, if you will, about turning our hearts back to the Lord. How many of you want to be right with God? Amen. Amen. That's what should be our goal. It shouldn't be, uh, you know, you figure out the way you want to live. I'll figure out the way I want to live. It doesn't work like that. God's the one who makes the rules. And we need to keep his law and his will and his way. Um, Let's look at Psalms chapter 80. Would you read verse 8 through 14? And that will give us a starting point. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Thou preparedest room before it and didst cause it to take deep root and it filled the land. The hills were covered with the shadow of it and the the boughs thereof were like the goodly cedars. She went out her, her bows, she sent out her bows unto the sea and her breaches unto the river. Why hast thou then broken down her bridges, hedges, so that all they which pass by the way do pluck her? The boar out of the wood doth waste it, and the wild beast of the field doth devour it. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and behold, and visit this vine. O Father God, we just thank you, Lord. For your word. Bless it now to these people's hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated as some gentlemen come up to uh, do our special today. Let's make sure our hearts are ready to hear from what God has to say for us. I think all these mics are set, gentlemen. Yeah. 
set. Amen. The book of Psalms, if you would, chapter 80. Psalms chapter 80, as we begin this morning. We've uh, done several things to prepare us for right now. Um, We've sang, we've prayed, we've given, we've worshiped, and I hope your heart is feeling gratitude towards God right now. And now I hope it's my goal that we desire to hear what he has to say. Now, I'm going to throw us off just for a moment because I read this this morning to my uh, Sunday school class. Um, We do dad jokes in my Sunday school class. And uh, this morning, they were too much dad joke. But uh, there was one I thought was really good. I'll share that. We'll get started for a little humor Uh, this morning. A Sunday school teacher was discussing the Ten Commandments with her five- and six-year-olds. After explaining the commandment to honor thy father and thy mother, she asked, Is there a commandment that teaches us? how to treat our brothers and sisters. Without missing a beat, the little boy answered, Thou shalt not kill. (laughs) All right, those of you with siblings, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Psalms chapter 80. Psalms chapter 80. We read verse 8, and I do want to get to that, but I do want to look at a couple things before that. There is in our country many who have an apathy to God and His will. What is God's will? What is God's desire? What was His design in creating you? I think that's a pretty fair question. What is God's purpose for giving you breath? Because if God at any moment shows... I don't want to give them breath anymore. You would not be alive. So who sustains our breath and gives us life? God. So the question simply, unless you believe that somehow we came from nothing and something blew up in the atmosphere and slowly over time we have become humans with morality. If you believe that, uh, friend, can I tell you, (laughs) we need to talk. We need to talk. A lot of people believe that today. Where did morality come from? Well, it just came to be. No, no, no. If there's morality, there has to be a moral giver. 
There has to be someone who started it all. And of course, we know that to be God himself, the creator, the designer, and he has a plan. We are talking this month on love. Last week, we talked about marriage. What does God say about marriage? We're talking about love. This week, I want to talk about your love for God. Your love for God. Psalms chapter 80. And I want you to take, if you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write down this phrase, turn me back to you. Turn me back to you. This is personal between us and God. In Psalms chapter 80, I want you to look down at three verses. Look at verse 3, verse 7, verse 19. Look at verse 3 with me. Turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to what? And we shall be saved. Look at verse 7. Turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Look down just a little farther in uh, verse 19. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts, cause thy faith to shine, and we shall be saved. We read a minute ago about this vine, and we're going to explain what that vine is and the purpose of that vine and how they had disregarded God and his plan and did their own thing. And the result of disregarding God and his plan and doing your own thing. My friend, that's still today. Many say they love God, but their works reveal what they really love. Their opinion, power, being right. Everyone is looking out for number one. A real revival comes when we realize our faithless, disobedient lives are against God. Say, Pastor, I've come here today, and what are you going to do? Just yell at me? No, friend, I want to show you hope. I want to show you how to live in a way that pleases our Creator. Not here to upset somebody or try to preach hellfire and damnation. No, no, I want to show you how to love God the way He wants to be loved. That's the goal today. And the goal today is to get you and I to humble ourselves and say, I need to turn back to God. There are some things in my life that are not pleasing to Him. So let's look at just a quick overview here of this chapter. In verses 1 through 5, we'll not get to all of these, but if you're taking notes, just for kind of an outline... Verses 1 through 5, we see a proper acknowledgement. In verse 6, we see there was a poor testimony. In verse 12, we see there's personal protection. In verse 16 and 17, we look into the future and we see the power of the Son of Man. And then we see the plea of the psalmist in verse 19. Now, we don't have any time, we don't have enough time to cover each one of those in detail, but we are going to summarize the book. Asaph was a musician for David and Solomon and even a little past Solomon, and most believe that uh, he had some influence on this chapter. Now, there's some dispute when this chapter was actually written. Now, some believe, and this is kind of where I lean. I kind of lean more towards it was during when the northern kingdom of Israel, Israel is divided into two nations, northern kingdom, Samaria, southern kingdom, Judah. Assyria would come down and take the northern kingdom captive, and I believe it was at this time when this psalm may have been penned. At any rate, uh, when it was penned, we're uncertain, but I do believe we can take a lot of notes and understanding here. So let me grab my water here. Psalms chapter 80, and starting in verse 1. Look what the Bible says here. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. Who was the shepherd of Israel? God. He was the controller. He he guided, he protected, and uh, he, he was there for them. Notice what it said. Thou that leadest Joseph like a flock. <coughs> Thou that dwellest between the cherubims shine forth. You have to excuse me. I have a tickle in my throat. <coughs> I want you to write down this statement. In order for us to turn back to God, we must sense our personal need. Sense our personal need. You need a shepherd. You need a guide. You need a protector. And I hope that's God for your life. We need to sense our personal need. Friend, you are not always right. You are not always right. Neither am I. We need somebody to help us and to guide us, sense our personal 
need. The psalmist understood Yahweh was the shepherd of the flock. He guided and protected them. <coughs> the psalmist understood God was present and interested in their life. Isn't it interesting in verse 1 we see he was the leader, he was the guide for Israel. Thou that dwellest between the cherubims shine forth. In the tabernacle, there would have been the cherubims on the Ark of the Covenant. And basically what the psalmist is observing is that the fact that God, heaven itself, had come down to dwell amongst the children of Israel. I'm shocked. It's crazy. <coughs> you have to forgive me today. <coughs> Excuse me. It's crazy to think that the God of heaven came down to dwell with his people. And this is what the psalmist was observing, that he had a personal need that only God can fill. He asked him to shine forth. You remember here, uh, back in these verses, he said at the end of verse 1, shine forth. When God shines, darkness and gloom vanish, and he is magnified. Right? We live in a dark world, and it seems to be getting darker by the day, doesn't it? Just confusing and darkness everywhere and nobody knows exactly what is going on. But when God's light shines, darkness and gloom vanish. So we see we need to sense our personal need. Now I don't have time to go into each one of these, but verse 2 goes into how they surround the Ark of the Covenant when they would travel. We don't have time to get into all of that. But I want you to think about this for a minute. Satan or the enemy seeks to destroy you. He is seeking today to trip you up, to cause you to stumble, to mess up your life. He desires for you to fail. Say, Pastor, why do we need God? Because you're not perfect. You don't have it all together. We need to understand today that you have a need, and that need can only be filled by God. At the end of service, sometimes we'll have, today we'll have it as well, we'll have an altar call. There's nowhere in the Bible that says you have to walk forward and kneel at an altar to do business with God. But we believe at the end of a service, you need to deal with what God is putting on your heart. And in my opinion, I believe it is vital when you're going before a king and you're humbling yourself. I think there are times in your life where you ought to bow down before a holy God. I think there's times where it's very important to step out of your seat and take steps and walk to an altar, not so anyone can see you. Now, I, once again, it's not in the Bible. You don't have to come and bow at an altar. It's not what the Bible says. But I think it's an act of worship and adoration for who God is and what he needs. And what are you saying when you do that? You're saying, God, I need you. I don't have all this figured out. You need to sense your personal need. You say, Pastor, I've accepted Christ as my Savior. I am one of his children. I know I'm on my way to heaven. You know what needs, you need to do? Sense your personal need. Stop relying on yourself in the Bible stories you once heard in Bible school or whatever it may be. Um, we started this book. Um, someone at, told us to use this for our children. It's called a Bible Story. The Bible Stories. Uh, John R. Rice put the book together of a bunch of Bible stories for children. So each night we're reading those Bible stories to our kids. The other night they wanted to do a. Uh, they wanted to act out some of the Bible stories. So we said, Riley and Lucas, go ahead and do it. Quest and I were sitting in our chairs, and Riley and Lucas go around the corner, and they get all excited, and they're planning it out, what they're going to do, and they walk out of there, and uh, Riley stands up really tall, and Lukey comes up, and he does this. And, you know, we're thinking, okay, aerobics, I don't know what's going on here, an extra elliptical or whatever it is, I don't know, and all of a sudden, Lukey, or Riley, falls, and then Lukey falls. And by then, we're so confused, we don't know what's going on. So we just guess the basic story they know the most, David and Goliath. Sure enough, we were right. I said, Lukey, if you're David, you can't fall. <laughs> you are the victor. You're, someone's teaching you. We have to talk to some Sunday school teachers here in junior church. I don't know what version of the Bible they're using, but that's the wrong one. David didn't fall. Now, we, we didn't tell them that, you know, David was supposed to go up and chop off the head of Goliath. We left out that part because Lukey would try. So we didn't want to do that to his older sister, so we left that out. And then they went back, and they said, we want to do another one. And they went back, and they came out, and they, uh, Lucas stood up, and Riley got on all fours, and she went, grr. 
He said, Riley, if you're going to be a lion, you've got to be meaner than that. And she's like, grr. It's like, Riley, you're, you're not helping your story. She's so sweet and dainty. I said, Riley, be mean. And she said, grr. <laughs> I was like, this was hopeless. We're not doing that. And then they went back and they came out and did something else where uh, Riley, Lucas loved it because Riley got down all fours. Lukey jumped on top of her. We think, we're still not sure, we think it was a story of Mary and Joseph going to have the baby. But we said, this isn't working. This is way off. At any rate, they learn stories in church. And sometimes we rely on those stories we learned in Sunday school or in church years ago. And that's how we live our personal life based on those stories. Frank, can I tell you, you need to quit just thinking about those stories and how maybe they had a little meaning. And you need to sense your personal need of God today. You need God. You're a sinner. You're wrong. Your mind goes the wrong way. You do things that are wrong. You need God. What would you tell him this morning? When you woke up, I think one thing we miss in our walk with the Lord is we don't say very often, God, I need you today. God, guide my mouth, guide my tongue. God, guide my temper. God, guide these things. God, I need you. It's not so much here. Look down at verse, uh, go down just a little bit in verse three and four and five. Verse 3, the Bible says this, Turn us again, O God, and cause thy faith to shine, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long wilt thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? The psalmist is saying, turn us. Listen closely to what I'm about to say. When you sense your need of God, you're no longer telling God, change my circumstances. You're telling God, turn me to be more like you. See, this is the prayer of those who are not walking as close to God. And this is the prayers of those who are praying in their flesh. We don't want God's will. We want our will to be done. But the psalmist is saying, God, turn me back to you so I can know your will. The psalmist isn't saying, God, change all these bad things that are happening. He's saying, turn me to be more like you to understand your will. Now, is it wrong to pray that God would give you more money to pay a bill? No, that's not the point here. The point is this. Turn me to know your will, God. Psalmist is saying, you don't have to change everything around me. God, I just need you. I need to sense you. I need to know that you're here with me. God was not necessarily changing these circumstances. By the way, friend, God's face will not shine or give favor on sin. If you are living in sin, God's face and favor will not shine upon you. Say, Pastor, that's not very nice. Friend, if you're living in sin, God will not bless that. That's why you need to have that sensing of, I need God and his will and his ways. And listen, I'm willing to change. I'm willing to alter the course of my life. God, cause your face to shine. If you want to just write down a scripture here, where does he get this idea of causing your face to shine? It's from the book of Numbers. Chapter 6 and verse 24, I don't know, for three verses or so, 24 through 26. But it has the idea of God's presence, pleasure, and favor. How many of you want God's favor on your life? Maybe you and I need to pray, God, turn me back to you to know your way. God, it's not about the circumstances. It's not about, God, I'm putting you on front street. If you'll do this, I'll do this. No, no, no. It's saying, God, I need you and I sense my need of you. Notice here in verse 7, very quickly. Turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy faith to shine, and we shall be saved. Let's look at what he's talking about here. Look at verse 8. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Who did God bring out of Egypt? Israel. God has brought a vine. We're talking about Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. What is he talking about? You remember Canaan was filled with the Moabites, all the other ites, the groups of people out there. God went through with Joshua. You remember he went to the land and he just started to defeat people and they started to, to leave the area, even though they didn't do all they should have. But what is he saying here? God brought Israel out. He planted it in verse 9. You prepared room for it and it's caused it to take deep root. And it what? Build the land. 
God gave them a land flowing with milk and honey. The hills were covered with the shadows of it. The boughs thereof were like the goodly cedars. She sent out her boughs onto the sea and her branches onto the river. And I think that's referring to the way they ran the, the Mediterranean in that time before the Philistines came back. But what is this talking about? What is this talking about, guys? It's talking about Israel. <clears throat> I'm going to walk around with this. Israel was chosen by God, and God had a plan for them. God did everything they needed and brought them to a place where they could serve him and pronounce his name to everyone. But you know what happened? I want you to think about this for a minute. Instead of sensing their need for God, you know what they did? They wasted their opportunity. They wasted the opportunity that God gave them. Now, many passages in the Old Testament speak of Israel and the vine, and it talks about it in the New Testament. But I ask you today, are you wasting the opportunities God's given you? Friend, I'll be honest with you. We need a revival of people getting serious about the things of God. You don't have a lot of time left. Doesn't matter how young you are, doesn't matter how old you are, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about God has given you something if you're His child. By the way, if you're here today and you're not His child, you've never accepted Him, friend, today can be that day. Because if you don't, eternity's not looking good. It's not looking good. But, friend, don't waste the opportunity God gave you. If God's made you a grandma, you don't waste that opportunity to show your children how to walk with the Lord, your grandchildren how to walk with the Lord. If you're a mama, don't waste that opportunity. If you're a dad, don't waste that opportunity. If you're an uncle, don't waste that opportunity. But, my friend, if you're a child of God, God has redeemed you. God has saved you. You have a purpose in this world. And it's not to sit around and watch Netflix and get on Facebook and be heard all the time. It's about serving him and advancing the kingdom of God. Don't waste that opportunity. Because what happened? Look at verse 13 and 14. This is what the psalmist is pleading. And this is kind of why I believe it's when the northern kingdom was taken by Assyria. Why hast thou then broken down her hedges? In Israel, when there would be a vine area, they would have hedges with thorns and different things to keep out uh, enemy, to keep out people who may take things, or to keep out animals. There would be a protection. And the psalmist here is saying, God, you used to protect us. You used to keep Assyria away. You used to keep Egypt away. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. Israel wasted what God had given them, and now God had to bring judgment upon them to get their attention. God took away his hand of protection because they wasted what God had given them. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God, isn't it? But it's a big deal, friend, today. Look at what the the psalmist is implying. Look down at verse 13. Or excuse me, verse 12. Why is then the broken down her hedges? So that all they which pass by the way do what? They take from her. So when Assyria would come down to do business in Egypt, they would take some from Israel. When trade routes would come through, they would take things from Israel. They would make them weaker and weaker and weaker. Until one day the boar out of the wood doth waste it, and the wild beasts of the field doth devour it. Some people believe this will refer to Rome one day. There's a picture of Rome. I don't necessarily know that for a fact, but when a boar comes in, a boar ruins the crops for a farmer. They say they've come in and destroyed absolutely everything. Assyria came down, leveled the city of Samaria, took so many people captive. Why? Because God's people wasted an opportunity to point people to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They got caught up in worshiping other gods and being too busy for God and being too cool for God and loving the way of their life and not living for the Lord the way they should. Friend, listen. All around Israel, all the way around, if you look on a map, were enemies to God's people. You know what they were put there for? To represent God the way they should. They wasted their opportunity. And I hope if you're here today, you're not one of those wasting what God has given you. God has given you breath. God has given you financial stability of some sort. God has given you family. Are you using that for him or wasting that? Don't 
Don't sit there and waste your life. You only have a certain amount of years here on this earth. You know, we look at it and we see if we live 80 years, we're going to be fine. I was talking to, to Miss Myrtle yesterday. We were at her house and she was telling me about the age of her brothers and sisters. And I won't share her, her age, but she's been in this church a long time and served God faithfully. You don't know how long you'll live. But my friend, in comparison to eternity, it's not that long. Are you wasting what God has given you? Do you sense your need for the Lord? Number two, would you look here very quickly with me? Not only do we sense our need, but we see him and his way as our only hope. We see him and his way as our only hope. Look at verse 14 and verse 17. We're going to see a prophecy here. Stay with me. I'll be through in just a couple minutes here, just a short while. Look at verse 14. So this is the psalmist. He's saying, this is what's happened. God, you've done all these things. We've wasted it. We deserve this punishment. We deserve your judgment. And now we're ready to turn back. Look at verse 14. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and behold and visit this vine. God, come back. God, please. God, I've wandered from you. God, I've gone away from you. God, I've, I've wasted years of my life. God, I've lived in sin. I've lived in shame. And I've done things that you are not pleased with. God, return. God, return. Come back. God won't until you deal with the sin. Till you deal with the sin, you see him and his way as your only hope. You have tried time and again to make changes and turn over a new leaf, and yet there is still a problem. The problem is this. Stop justifying your sin and start acknowledging who you are sinning against that is a holy God. Take your Bible. Go to Proverbs 19. I want you to see this. Sin is not tolerable to God. Proverbs chapter 19. Would you look here very quickly? Very quickly, next book. Please don't waste opportunities that God has given you. See God as your only hope. Proverbs chapter 19. And I had all these on the screen. We just had some issues with the screen. Notice what the Bible says in 19 verse 9. A false witness shall not be unpunished. And he that speaketh lies shall what? Paris, do you think God cares about those who lie? Yes, I do. Go to Revelation chapter 21 very quickly. Very quickly, last book of the Bible, last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 21. Say, Pastor, God doesn't think this is a big deal. I can live any way I want. I can justify it. You can, but you won't have God's blessing. You won't have God. You say, Pastor, I came to church to be encouraged. Friend, the best life you can live is one in the center of God's will. You are missing so much. When you've justified your sin and your lifestyle, notice what the Bible says in verse 8 of chapter 21. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. One more, if you'd go to just one more with me, 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. Say, Pastor, God doesn't think my sin is a big deal. 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. Look down at verse 9. If you're not there, just listen. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now God says there's a group that will be in the kingdom of heaven. There's a group that will not be in the kingdom of heaven. But notice what the Bible says in verse 11 of chapter 6 in 1 Corinthians. And such were some of you. This defined your lifestyle. This is who you were. But what happened? But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. This is who you used to be. You humbled yourself. You understood you were a sinner. You fell at the feet of the cross and you said, I'm a sinner. I believe I need a Savior. I'm no longer going to justify my sin. I accept the fact that my sin will be punished. My, I will be judged for every sinful thing I have ever done. And I accept Jesus... 
in my place as my Savior. You understand, back in the book of Psalms, we see in chapter 80, the psalmist is saying, God, would you look on us in verse 1. God, help us to turn back to you so your face will shine on us once again. And now he's saying in verse 14 of Psalms 80, return, we beseech thee, O God. What was the only hope for Israel? Look at verse 17. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom thou madest strong, for thyself. I believe this is a picture of Jesus. I believe, now I don't necessarily believe that the psalmist understood everything he was saying other than the fact that God had a plan. I believe this Son of Man is Jesus Christ Himself, the Messiah. By the way, your only hope, the only way for heaven is through Jesus Christ. And the only way to be blessed on this earth and have God's favor is to be right with Him through Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the only way. It's not being religious. It's not going to a church. The only way to be right with God is through Jesus Christ. Now, once you've accepted him and you're his child and you're walking with him and you start to slip away, then you need to say, God, I need to turn back to you. See him and his way as our only hope. Sense your need today. Lastly, sincerely desire him to be glorified in your life. Sincerely desire him to be glorified in your life. In verse 3, he said, turn us again. In verse 7, he said, turn us again. Lastly, as he concludes this psalm in verse 19, turn us again, O Lord God of hosts. Cause thy faith to shine, face to shine, and we shall be saved. Sincerely desire him to be glorified in your life. I wish I could say that every day I wake up Just say it in my head. God, be glorified. God, I just want to do everything for you on a Monday when I'm tired and I'm exhausted and I'm wore out. It's been a long week and I've had some bad news and something has happened. I wish I could tell you that I wake up on Mondays, every Monday, and say, God, just be glorified. This is good. Some days we're down in the dumps. Some days our minds take over. There are some days when we're walking in the wrong direction. You know what we need to do like the psalmist? We need to understand we need God. We need His way. We need his hand of blessing on our life because some of us, God's removed his protection like Israel. Listen to this story. In the 1994 article, uh, Wars, uh, Lethal Leftovers Threaten Europeans. Associated Press reporter Christopher Burns write, the bonds of World War II are still killing in Europe. They turn up and sometimes blow up at construction sites, fishing nets, or on beaches 50 years after the guns went silent. Hundreds of tons of explosives are recovered every year in France alone. Thirteen old bombs exploded in France last year, killing 12 people and wounding 11. I've lost two of my colleagues who heads, of, uh, who heads a government team in champagne Ardennes region that diffuses explosives from World War I and World War II. Unexploded bombs became more dangerous with time. With the corrosion inside, the weapon becomes more unstable and the detonator can be exposed. My friend, over in that time, after World War I and World War II, there were lingering issues that were never dealt with. Then, if I may spiritualize this a little bit, there are lingering sins that are just left. Well, it's okay. I, you know, we all, we, don't we justify it like this? We all do bad things. We all mess up. We're all just human. Isn't that what we say? Friend, don't, that's not what we say when we want God's blessing. It's not what we say when we want God's favor. We sense our need of Him. We see Him as our only way of hope. And then we sincerely desire Him to be glorified in our lives. Do you want that again? Uh, we don't have time to go there this morning, but in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11, it talks about desiring the word in our Bible as conversation, but it's the idea of our lifestyle to be like his. Can I ask you, do you, have you thought about it at all this week? Is God glorified in the way I'm living? Or could I be doing more for the kingdom of God? My friend, I would encourage you to strongly think about this. And if you're living in sin that God has condemned, I would challenge you to turn to God. 
Don't give God a bunch of excuses about why you can't or about why you can't or why it won't work or why it can't get this. Or You just turn to God and you say, God, I've lived in sin. I repent of my sin. I turn back to you. I want to live for you from today forward. Deal with the sin. Deal with the shame. Deal with the hurt. Deal with the pain. Deal with it. Turn it over to God. Turn us again. Turn us again. Turn us back to you. The psalmist was not making excuses. He was declaring that God was the shepherd. God delivered them out of Egypt. God had done all of these things. God removed his hand of protection. God had done all these things. And the psalmist is saying, if we want you, God, in your favor on our lives and in our marriage and in our relationships, we need to do it your way. Turn me back to you. Turn me back to you. Can I ask you this this morning? Would you turn back to him? Would you? It's not too late. It's not too late to change. By the way, if you do it God's way, He will bless you. Some things are just hidden inside. They're like one of those old bombs from the old wars. One day they'll just pop up and explode. They were never dealt with. The devil is working hard in this world. And can I say sadly, he's getting at Christians. He's getting Christians to doubt and getting Christians who once served and getting people who used to be faithful to God and now they're away. Would you sense your need? Would you see him as your only hope? And would you sincerely desire for him to be glorified in your life? Oh, friend, would you do business with God today? Heads bowed and eyes closed all throughout this auditorium. I hope you don't feel like... God doesn't care about you because God does. God cares very deeply. And today, right now, I think God's working on some hearts. I think God is working in some individuals. Miss Amanda is about to start playing on the piano. And as she does, if you're here and God's spoken to you in any capacity, would you do business with God? Would you take a moment and sense Him as your need? All around the room. You know you haven't done the right thing. Say you want God's favor, but you don't want to do it God's way. Several have come. Will you do business with God? If I may ask this, those sitting there, would you do me a favor? Please don't look around. This is nobody's business but yours and God's. You're here today for a reason. Maybe you're in this room and you would say, Pastor Lang, I know there's a time and place in my life where I humbled myself. I knew I needed a Savior and I accepted Jesus as my Savior. There was a time and place where I did that. All around the room, you would lift your hands to the Lord. You say, I know I've done that. That's me. I'm saved. I know I've accepted Christ. There's a time and place. I humbled myself. Those hands down. If you're here today and you were not able to raise your hand to a holy God, honestly, And you would say, Pastor Lang, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. All around the room, you say, Pastor Lang, I don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Would you pray for me? I want to pray for you. I will not call you out. I'm not here to embarrass you. Say, Pastor, just pray for me. I don't know. All around the room, you know in your heart right now, God's working. God's doing a work. Don't ignore him. Don't ignore him. Don't push him aside. There is a real hell. There is a real lake of fire. And if you will not submit to a holy God and come his way, you will not enjoy the pleasures of heaven. That's God's word. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm not here to get you to join my church or to get you to become a part of being a Baptist or to get you to come in and do this or that. I want you to know in your heart that you're ready to stand before a holy God one day. Your sins have been justified by Jesus Christ because of your faith. Oh, friend, don't walk out of this room without knowing. You don't know when he'll return. Pastor Lane, God's working on my heart. God's working on my heart. Pray for me. Pray for me. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you. Lord, I thank you for your word today, God. I know it. God, I know this worked on my heart. 
all through the week. God, you've given us a picture of everything you've done for Israel. Delivered them, showed them victory after victory. Gave them everything they needed. Put them in the land of promise. And they turned their back on you. They were not fully committed to you. Other things popped up that were more important in their lives. And God, as a result of that, you removed your hand of blessing, your hand of favor. And God, it wasn't until they would repent and turn back to you, God, that you would bless them once again. God, I thank you that we have the same method today. God, you tell us, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, you are a just God. And I pray each one of us in here would leave here with the understanding that we need you. We can't do it on our own. We don't have enough wisdom. We haven't been to school enough. We, we need you. And God, I pray that we'll recognize the only hope we have is through Jesus. And God, I pray that each one in this room, as they walk out their door, their sincere desire would be that their lives bring glory to your holy name and to your agenda for this earth. God, I pray sin would be dealt with in families today, my life today. God, I pray we wouldn't continue to put it off. We would recognize it and understand it. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. If you would, please look this way. If you'd stand for us here today, we'll be dismissed. I know it's just a little late here. If you would, on your way out, there's a little devotional. It's called the Days of Praise. It starts in March. And it will go April through May. They're free. Uh, just uh, first one, you know, first one to get to them. There's several on the back table. If you'd like to take one with you, the only thing I ask is that you use it. It's just a simple one-page devotional, little page, and I, I think it's very beneficial for your walk with the Lord. If you'd like to grab one, grab one of those on the way out. If you're going to that uh, couple's dinner, make sure you sign up. And uh, thank you all for being here. Visitors, thank you for coming. Uh, those who are here all the time, we're glad to have you. And uh, God bless you. Have a great week. Choir, we will have practice tonight at 545. Brother Brian, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer? Our precious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for today. Father, thank you for allowing us to meet this morning, Lord, and, and worship you. Father, I just thank you for the message. Lord, I pray that we will ponder it through this week, Lord. Father, that we'll seek to live for you. Father, to do your will, Lord. And Father, now I pray that you would just be with each and every one of us. Lord, as we go our separate ways, protect us and watch over us and bring us all back. The next one in our Father, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.